Hey, hey, this is your girl Rashida G and you are listening to the Crossroads podcast, a show for and about environmental justice and those who fight the fight with skin as melanated as the days are long. Knowledge is power and we're breaking down stereotypes one episode at a time. Let's start the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of The Crossroads. So this episode is a case study. We are walking through Dr. Robert Bullard's book, Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Environmental Quality. The book was first published in 1990 and examined black neighborhoods in the South that experienced environmental disasters and health hazards during the late 70s through the 1980s. I'm going to provide some historical background while discussing three major takeaways that I found while reading this book. So the 70s energy crisis was a mainstream environmentalist opportunity to embrace equity issues. Prior to that, most of environmentalism was and still continues to be very middle class, white led and focused. So some of the the, the major movements during the time came from the 1960s and 70s and incidences like the Love Canal and Times Beach receiving major media coverage and resulting in changes in legislation. The mainstream environmentalist movement originated for the need for wilderness preservation and resource conservation, meaning keeping specific areas pristine and also at a distance from urban areas. The environmental justice movement emerged from civil rights and didn't begin until the 1980s. And at the time Dumping was published, there wasn't much research on environmental quality in black communities. A lot of the attention was being paid to crime, drugs, and poverty, because as we now know, this was the start of the war on poverty and the war on drugs. There is ample documentation indicating that black people and low income and working class groups are subjected to disproportionate amounts of pollution and other environmental issues, such as the building of municipal solid waste facilities, hazardous waste plants, toxic waste dumps, chemical emissions from industrial plants and on the job hazards. Dumping in Dixie uses five cities as case studies. They are the Northwood community in Houston, Texas, West Dallas, Texas, Institute, West Virginia, Alston, Louisiana, and Emil, Alabama. All of these neighborhoods are predominantly black, low to middle class working families. All of them were mobilized when faced with unwanted environmental burden. Who won or lost is not clear in every case. The communities differed in size and location and were a mixture of rural, suburban, and urban. Some were incorporated, others weren't which created a loophole for corporations to create the burden without having to pay taxes to the community. Land use decisions involved involving the black community are often made by developers and zoning boards with no ties to the community. Which brings me to my first point. Environmental protection is inequitable. Sites for locally unwanted land use or LULUs are put in black neighborhoods And this came as a direct result and response to the not in my backyard from the mainstream environmental movement. A quick word about NIMBY is really that it doesn't just extend to environmental burdens or unwanted land use. It also includes areas and aspects of housing. Many of these communities with more affluence don't want to have homeless shelters in their communities or halfway houses, different types of homes and housing that don't reflect the level of affluence and having these environmental burden sites such as landfills and hazardous waste plants being disproportionately put in communities of color. Doing this was considered a path of least resistance. The pollution of black neighborhoods was and continues to be a major issue. So Dr. Bullard used Houston, Texas as a case study In 1982, Dr. Bullard found that there were still cities, or still neighborhoods, excuse me, without paved roads, gas and sewer connections, running water, or routine garbage services. 
Black and Latinx communities were denied access to basic municipal services. Houston operates 13 waste disposal facilities. That's a combination of incinerators and landfills. 12 of the 13 are in low-income Black and Brown neighborhoods. The Northwood community in Houston was unincorporated and had no zoning to designate land use. Whispering Pines Municipal Landfill was built in the middle of the community without prior knowledge or consent from the Northwood residents. The residents filed a lawsuit to stop the facility from being built, but it was denied. And Whispering Pines was built and placed in very close proximity to multiple public schools, one of which did not have AC at the time and the windows were left open. Local government made changes to permit issuance guidelines and restricted industry from building sites near public areas such as schools. This was the only neighborhood out of all five that had any legislation changes. So second point that I found very interesting in this book, lead poisoning. So the subject of lead poisoning came up in Dumping in Dixie, and as we know, we're facing issues with lead poisoning even to this day. Part of the framework for environmental justice is the incorporation of public health and a public health model, which requires the prevention of harm. Childhood lead poisoning is a preventable issue that has not been eradicated. Right now, New Jersey is experiencing lead contamination in their water, and as we know, Flint, Michigan hasn't had clean water since April of 2014. Dr. Butler classified West Dallas, Texas as a a classic urban ghetto. His words, not mine. The community was a mix of absentee owned homes and public housing. Household heads were single parents and two thirds lived below the poverty line. The RSR Corporation built a lead smelter 50 feet from residents. A smelter is an industrial plant that converts lead ore into lead. This process requires combustion, which means high heat, and the smoke from the plant that has to be released. Lead from the plant poisoned children for over 50 years. RSR never had proper permits to use the land, which means the city of Dallas, who owns the land, could have forcibly closed the plant and didn't. It was open for 50 years years. A little more context. In 1978, the EPA created the National Ambient Air Quality Standard to limit the amount of airborne lead. Still, a 1981 study showed, as it had years before, that children living near lead smelters in West Dallas had higher concentrations of lead in their blood than children that did not. This case was a gross mishandling by the EPA. Plans to clean up the area around the smelter were canceled unnecessarily. Hearings didn't start until 1983, and this was after the case made national news two years earlier. The failing came from every level of the EPA, from regional to national. The Dallas Attorney General and the city sued RSR for $20 million on behalf of 370 children, and it was also requested that the plant close, which it did. So this also segues into the third interesting point that I found in this reading, which is this idea of the environment versus economics. In addition to the case study, Dr. Bullard surveyed individuals from each community. 527 participants were asked questions about their level of activism, their greatest environmental concern, etc. Dr. Bullard also provided detailed information on how each community issue was classified and the type of tactics used to raise awareness on the issue and demand action. What was interesting was the question of economics or jobs versus environmental trade-off. In communities that lacked access to employment, the building of a hazardous waste plant seemed like a trade-off as it in theory supplied or would supply jobs to the community. Encouragement to make this sacrifice often came from city leaders with the promise of better jobs and improved neighborhood infrastructure. In most cases, the benefits did not outweigh the costs. Dr. Bullard asked survey participants several questions to assess economic trade-off, such as if there were any tax benefits from the company to the community, the health risks that they were experiencing, increased or any identifiable employment opportunities, etc. 
Two thirds of the participants stated that the environment wasn't secondary to jobs and showed no evidence of environmental bias. And this basically means that black folks do care about the environment. Two of the poorest communities that Dr. Bullard surveyed were West Dallas, Texas and Emil, Alabama, a small town in Sumter County. And they indicated that the facilities in their community, a lead smelter and a hazardous waste facility respectively, were more important than environmental concerns. Chemical Waste Management, or Chem Waste, was the largest employer in Sumter County and built the largest plant in the county as well. Residents were not consulted before the plant was built. Between 1983 and 1984, there were six off-site spills and 12 on-site spills. The plant received waste from Superfund sites as well as other hazardous waste. Chemicals received at this site included heavy metals, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, and when you think of that, basically just think cancer. Conversely, Chem Waste paid a waste tax, which did funnel into public services such as law enforcement and, and emergency services. The federal EPA stopped shipping Superfund waste to Emil in 1985. For context, the site was built in 1978. The ban was lifted, however, even after it was found that aquifers were contaminated and the groundwater monitoring systems in the facility were faulty. According to the survey, half of a mill residents were employed by Kim Waste. In general, though, 62% of all participants saw no improvements in employment with the facilities in their neighborhoods. The jobs in the plants didn't align with the skill sets of the community members. The survey showed that the promise of jobs and opportunity aren't always delivered. So we've come to the crossroads. So first of all, why does all of this matter, right? Issues of environmental burdens or LULUs are still occurring today. The length of time from when these case studies were done and the incidences is not that significant. Hazardous waste plants pollute the atmosphere and the water, the impacts of local community health, but also the natural ecosystem and contributes to climate change. Out of all the facilities Dr. Buller surveyed, only one of them closed. The others are still operating. One facility in particular lo located in Institute, West Virginia, had a poisonous gas leak that sent people to the hospital. That same plant was open in India and caused the death of 3,500 people and maimed thousands more. People should not have to choose between the environment and physical health and employment. It's simply unfair. As Dr. Baller demonstrates, the trade-offs don't outweigh the impact. Long-term exposure to PCBs and heavy metals lead to cancer and destroy plant and marine life. Dumping in Dixie also emphasizes the importance of land use and ownership. Some of the communities were unincorporated or had no zoning to designate land for specific uses. Also, some landowners were forced to sell their land amid falling prices, as in the case of Emil. Having no zoning rules, as then the Northwood Manor community didn't have, means that there aren't any restrictions on land use. That's how a massive landfill could be built in the middle of a neighborhood. We as a black community have a responsibility to remain informed and represented in public office, as well as mainstream environmental groups. Dr. Buller cited this in his book as well. While protest was a key tactic in most of these cases, some areas like Emil had difficulty rallying support. Most activism was found to come from the church, which, you know, isn't surprising as the church was a key meeting place during the civil rights movement. While not every resident considered their experience to be environmental by definition, they expressed knowing that what was happening to them wasn't equitable and attributed to race. This fits in the definition of environmental racism, which is an injustice reinforced by government, legal, economic, and political institutions. This book shows that environmentalists can emerge from black space regardless of class. Dr. Bullard also encouraged the mobilization of grassroots organizations to effect change on the local level. 
One last thing I want to do before we wrap up the show is I want to read to you the preamble and a few of the principles that were created from the first National People of Color Environmental Justice Leadership Summit. Say that three times fast. It was held in October in 1991 in Washington, D.C. It says, we, the people of color, gathered together at this multinational people of color environmental leadership summit to begin to build a national and international movement of peoples of color to fight the destruction and taking of our land and communities to do hereby reestablish our spiritual interdependence to the sacredness of mother earth respect and celebrate each of our cultures languages and beliefs about our natural world and our role in healing ourselves to ensure environmental justice to promote economic alternatives which would contribute to the development of environmental safe livelihoods and to secure our political economic and cultural liberation that has been denied for over 500 years of colonization and oppression, resulting in the poisoning of our communities and land and the genocide of our peoples, do affirm and adopt these principles of environmental justice. Number one, environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species, and the right to be free from ecological destruction. Two, environmental justice demands that public policy be based on mutual respect and justice for all peoples, free from any form of discrimination or bias. Three, environmental justice mandates the right to ethical, balanced, and responsible uses of land and renewable sources, resources in the interest of a sustainable planet for humans and other living things. Four, Environmental justice calls for universal protection from nuclear testing and the extraction, production, and disposal of toxic or hazardous materials and poisons that threaten the fundamental right to clean air, land, water, and food. Number five, environmental justice affirms the fundamental right to political, economic, cultural and environmental self-determination of all peoples so there are actually 17 in total I just wanted to read a few of them but I really hope that this captures what I'm saying here in the crossroads which is really that all of these these ecosystems inclusive of our urban ecosystem all depends on the natural one and we have to be able to protect not just ourselves and our, our health, but also the health of our planet too, because it, it is all connected. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I first really encourage you to read Dumping and Dixie if you can. It is an older book and if you try to buy it on Amazon, it is a little bit expensive. So check out your local library. For those of you in school, see if you can um, rent it from or get it from your school library they may have a copy and I definitely encourage you to read it. Dr. Bullard has several books and several essays that he's written involving his work in in detail in Houston but also the the case studies that he's worked on across the country. Um, He's got a another really good book with Beverly Wright who is a Hurricane Katrina survivor. I definitely recommend that. He also talks about mobility justice He's a very, very versed man. He's a pioneer. He's worked at a a couple of HBCUs. He's always a proponent of the HBCU experience. So I, I really encourage everyone to get familiar with him. And I also encourage you to find a local environmental justice group and get involved with them. They are out there. You know, Dr. Bullard really encouraged that as well. In his book, he actually included a list of different groups broken out by state Obviously, with the book being as old as it is, you will have to verify that these groups are so active. But, you know, a quick Google search, Google will give you the answers. So I also encourage you to get involved in your community. Find out if your city is incorporated or not. Go to these city council meetings. I know they are difficult to get to, which, trust me, is deliberate. 
Some counties may have live streams and others might put the dates and times of their meetings and hearings on social media. Do whatever you can to stay informed. As I've said, you know, once you see the cranes, it's too late. On the next episode, I'm sitting down with Adonia Lugo to talk about mobility justice and her experience with cycling in LA. I'll see you guys then. Thank you.